<clears throat> All right. So welcome to the vision interview section of today's program. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Peter Knopf. Peter he leads the big scientific data and text analysis group, which is a part of the Knowledge Media Institute at the Open University. In addition, Dr. Noth is the founder and head of CORE, that's C-O-R-E, a large full text aggregator of open access papers with millions of active users. Previously, Dr. Noth worked as a senior data scientist at Mendeley and has been involved. He also co-founded uh, Cemento Metrics, if I got that correct, uh, aiming to take um, bibliometrics and build on bibliometrics and altmetrics to produce new research evaluation methods. He's been principal investigator in over 20 EC national and international funded research projects in the areas of text mining, open science, and e-learning. Welcome, Peter. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. So to start off, uh, beyond the brief bio that I listed off, could you just give us a little bit of uh, more information from your perspective about your team, uh, the work that they do? So um, my team has been set up to basically um, deal with the needs and the problems uh, related to supporting um, researchers and uh, the, the general public in accessing research, basically. And we realize that researchers these days and in the future will continue consuming um, research information in different ways because there is an overwhelming amount of information and they will see or we will see that they will more and more rely on technology as a way of filtering and sifting through um, information so that they can select what matters to them, what is important to their use cases. No researcher these days basically can um, analyze and read all the literature that is relevant to them. And therefore, technology will uh, on the importance of technology as the as a as a as a means to um, uh, reading and and accessing information will only grow. And this is basically what my team is addressing. We you know what we are a team that is completely set up around the idea of developing technologies to help researchers to help actually not, not only researchers but the whole stakeholders. Uh, you know the range of stakeholders uh, in the scholarly communication system we sort of we are super sort of excited people in terms of uh, doing technology and we are interested in the application of ai and machine learning and uh, and all sorts of uh, computational processes to help um, realize this sort of vision and this vision is part of it's not, it's not only effectively um, a technology vision, it's a, it's a mission-driven idea, basically, to also support open access and open science. So there is a spectrum of text and data mining uh, technology in different disciplines and different research communities. Um, could you describe some like some of the use cases from the the very simple to the very complicated um and some examples of you know some standard uses and things that you help support yeah so uh, there are so many use cases that are available and i understand that often for people when i still you know when i start speaking about text and data mining they don't know what to sort of associate this with so i'll start uh, mentioning some of these use cases but uh, please stop me when i when you get bored and then because because there are just so many uh, i can sure. speak. so um <clears throat> the first one i think which um, most people will be super familiar with but they will not realize that it's text mining is something that i would call domain specific search engine I'll give an example. So um, imagine that you want to develop a search engine for chemistry, but the names of the chemical compounds have very strange names and they in get indexed really badly, like CO2, for instance, and or you know, names of names of various kinds of kinds of things. And so how do you develop a search engine like that? Well, you need to basically do text and text and data mining on those sort of substances. You need to index them correctly so that sort of people who are specialized in the discipline can actually find and locate those kinds of articles that they are really interested in. 
The same happens, um, you know, very much in medicine, for instance, as well. So that's why you see that um, um, you can't have like a general purpose um, search engine for literature across uh, across all uh, across all science. You need actually certain disciplines, not all, but there are certain disciplines that require. Uh, sort of domain specific approaches uh, to indexing of the content. And even though this sounds completely trivial, it is in fact already uh, one of the examples of how text and data mining gets, gets used. So that, therefore also when people sort of think text and data mining is the future, actually it's not the future, it's, it's the presence and the future as well. So I, I want to give some more examples. Also another sort of um, example system, which is completely you know, based on content mining and sometimes also user data and in combination of user with user data. Uh, so it's text and data mining are recommender systems. Um, I would say you know, something that most researchers these days are very familiar with. You go to a research paper and you want to get recommended similar sort of research papers. And um, I, I would say the vast majority, probably 90% plus of uh, research, 90% uh, of or more researchers have already used recommender systems in their um, in, in their scholarship. Basically, you know there are personalized recommender systems, which, for instance, recommend them uh, something which is relevant to them based on their past history of what they accessed in, in, in what they accessed and the search engine then believes and tries to predict effectively what they might be interested in the future. These search engines can also help them to notify, for instance, um, to help them, you know, it, they can help them uh, to notify them when a very interesting paper has just come out. And basically, they think that the, you know, the search engine, the recommender system, believes that they should really definitely read it. These systems are, tend to be really, really popular, and they tend to be, uh, they tend to be also, I would say, significantly needed, you know, helping the researchers to sort of focus on what matters and what information is fresh. But there are many other examples. Plagiarism detection is, is one of them, you know, a, a, a really nice example of text and data mining. Another example, which is very current these days, is fact checking. I really like this one. I'm very passionate about this one. Uh, so you see, for instance, the, the situation about um, uh, you know, when, when the COVID pandemic started, you see that a lot of people sort of uh, were, did not believe. They thought maybe that researchers are um, not consistent, that they think different things. The same happens uh, a lot with global warming, where we, you know, politicians like to say often, you know, there are, they, politicians sort of say, hey, there is a group of re researchers who believe that global warming is not man-made, while there is another group that believes that it is man-made. And because we need, so then we sort of find something in the middle. But the truth is that actually 95% plus researchers believe that global warming is man-made. And that's not what uh, you know the politicians are telling us. So can we have search engines that actually counter it, that help us to fact check information that we see in the media and to confront these sort of lies that are you know given uh, to the public and of course we can and we are for instance um, in uh, my team we're working uh, with uh, one specific startup in the US I don't want to give do marketing so I'm not going to name them but um, it is really about uh, you know finding um, you can build search engines that try to sort of understand what is the consensus of researchers and that then can be you know this sort of information can then be fed uh, to the public, and this, in my opinion, the, the, the importance of doing and catering for this use case will only grow um, and probably grow quite exponentially uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. But that's still not the end. <laughs> Another example might be innovation engineering. In fact, you know, we are working with some companies that believe that it is possible to sort of innovate systematically. There are certain patterns in how you innovate certain certain things, and 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 for of you know often it is the case, for instance, that when you when you try to come up with some sort of an innovation, you need to solve something that is called a conflict. You know, a certain thing needs to be um, needs to be fast, but it cannot be fast because then you have too much friction, for instance, and and therefore you know you're facing some sort of a physical conflict between uh, between um, certain variables and. It turns out to be the case that there are principles how to solve these conflicts, regardless on the discipline that you are sort of working in. And effectively, the question then is, can we find research literature, for instance, that, that managed to solve these conflicts so that an innovator 
when they face a conflict like this in a slightly different setting, can get inspired about the ideas, how it, how it already was used in the past. And therefore, they can be more efficient and effective in solving that very conflict. Another example, which is incredibly fascinating to me, is something that is called literature-based discovery. Literature-based discovery is basically the idea that you can make discoveries not only in the lab, you can make actual discoveries by reading lots of literature. And we only didn't make these discoveries because there's just so much literature to be read that no one read that particular combination of literature to sort of connect the dots. There were some examples in the past like migraine and, and magnesium deficiency, that these things are basically uh, you know, linked and they were simulated, you know, the, the, this, this is a discovery that was simulated by a computer, basically, uh, by reading lots of papers and basically, you know, actually making that assertion purely by reading research. I find this really, really amazing. And I think, again, uh, the application of this and basically of potentially software helping scientists to generate hypotheses, effectively, that can later be validated is, in, is incredibly interesting and incredibly interesting application of, of, um, uh, of um, uh, text and data mining. I'll just name some of those others, but because I think I'm getting too long, but um, you know, I'm, I, I'm excited about you know, the text and data mining can be used to extract entities in, you know, to create an open scholarly graph. It can be used in banking, for instance. It can be used you know, to make market predictions. Uh, because for instance, if there is a discovery of let's say LCDs, uh, you know, when there was an uh, the phone operators, they still continued, you know, uh, doing these and building these, 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 these really old phones like Nokia, for instance, and so on. And then suddenly there was a there was a market competitor who came with something completely revolutionary, you know, like a flat screen and a large device and so on. And that completely changed the, the, the market. And people would really like to know like this. this so, so the banking industry would like to know when these discoveries are coming because that helps to predict the price. And also these manufacturers would like to know when these major things are coming early in advance so that they can get ready. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there are some other examples. Research assessment in science is a brilliant one. A lot of the, you know, there's a lot of people who um, sort of are against the idea of bibliometrics. They think that it's stupid. They think that it's basically, um, uh, you know, to, um, it reduces basically the giving rewards to scientists. Um, it's, it's unethical and so forth. But imagine that we could combine bibliometrics with the analysis of the text that surrounds citations. Then we could sort of really understand in what context work is being cited. Is it the case that people are reusing that word? Are they reusing the idea? Are they criticizing the idea? I think this is incredibly interesting. And, and, and I think bibliometrics as a discipline is definitely going to go in that direction. Another example are systematic reviews in science. We would really like to know, for instance, that um, you know um, uh, whether there is a, a link between uh, ASD, um, autism spectrum disorder, and at the same time, we'd like to know whether um, this is linked, let's say, to vaccines. And it has been proven that it is not. But in order to prove these things, there had to be a, a, a panel that basically studied this for a very long time. And they came up with basically, you know, systematically studying, uh, you know, all sort of relevant literature and, uh, and so forth in this space. Um, and the question is now, can we have rapid systematic reviews, which sort of, you know, create basically we have software for these, uh, for these scientists who do the, who have to go through this very time consuming systematic review process and helps them, which would help them to speed up basically the process so that they can do more systematic reviews and faster. Mm. And maybe another last example uh, would for me would be finding experts. So um, in, uh, there's a big problem for publishers these days uh, to find experts who can peer review. There is also a problem with this, this very same problem happens with uh, for funders. They want to, you know, basically get experts who can uh, peer review um, applications. And this problem is, you know, something that can be solved uh, with the help of text mining, because you want to create panels that are non -bi not biased. You want to create panels that um, uh, where the people have good experience and because by, you know, demonstrated good experience by perhaps publishing in that very same area that you're trying to review, but you all, who also do not have conflicts with the authors themselves. 
And it turns out to be the case that you know, software and text and data mining can play a crucial role in reducing the, the, the manual burden in this space. Mm -hmm. That's so many applications. There's yes, the, <laughs> we can solve the world's problems. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in order to do this, uh, what kind of infrastructure do we need? What kind of tools, uh, data accessibility, um, what, what kind of community infrastructure do we need to support moving science in this direction? Yeah, um, so um, I think we need a basic, you know, a lot of the people who come to my team. Um, so my team provides basically uh, a, a large aggregator, which you mentioned at the beginning, uh, called Core. And what we do is that we aggregate literature, basically, um, from open access repositories, more than 10,000 uh, sources, and we try to be very comprehensive. But, uh, you know, there are always limits to this comprehensiveness. I would always like to be more comprehensive than we are at the moment, because at the moment we can be comprehensive for open access literature, but we cannot be comprehensive for non-open access literature, basically. So what I hear from the researchers that use our data set for text and data mining um, in a, uh, you know, on a regular basis is that, uh, do you have everything? Can I just rely on you as an infrastructure, on you as core? You, know, you provide an API, you provide an a, a data set. This is wonderful, but can I rely on you that you're not, never going to miss a paper? And to me, you know, this, this reply is, 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 is somewhat, somewhat convoluted because what I have to tell them is that, um, you know, we can get metadata of basically everything these days, but we can't guarantee to you that you will have access to the full text. And some of the applications which I mentioned, they really, really need the full text, or maybe they don't need it, but they could get better results if they had the full text. Sure. So what I would like to have is basically the world in which um, we can basically process all the scientific literature, whether you know, for metadata and full text, we had it in some sort of a semi-structured format so that anyone who wants to text and data mine it would have a really good start. There are lots of limitations at the moment to text and data mining, and we'll talk about them, I guess, maybe, you know, even later. But, but you know, the, the fundamental issue is basically that um, for these people who want to text and data mine research literature, it's really hard to start. You know, do they, are they supposed to sort of um, aggregate everything from more than 10,000 data providers themselves? Well, if they wanted to do that, then their project would be so expensive that they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't basically get the grant. Or, you know, do they rely on someone like us, basically? Um, you know, that's, uh, and that's probably the case. But even us, we cannot give them completely everything because there are still limits to them. So we give them, we give them the maximum that we can give them. But, uh, um, I would wish to give them more because one thing there's one thing that I realized you know, as a as a researcher and we realized it very early on when we started building core. I realized that um, the most the smartest application that will ever be built with the data that we aggregate is not going to be built by my team basically. So um, what we are trying to do is effectively, we recognize that you know, we work on the data ourselves too, but we want to give it away to the community basically, and to the companies, to the researchers, to everyone, and you know, to develop really amazing things with it. We know that the, there are so many use cases that we will never compete with each other. Basically science needs more. So um, you know, we're, we're, we're very fond of building this you know, for, for everyone. And we, we hope people will come, people will appreciate it and, um, and, and they will build amazing things with it. So would you say that a researcher working in this space, um, if they, they might take your uh, research um, collection yeah. and enhance it in their own way with their own, you know, maybe they have arranged a special chemistry collection uh, that they've built on their own and they bind those two things together to yeah. produce the results that they're, they're seeking. Exactly. You know, um, every, like, um, uh, when I speak to researchers um, and developers, they often come with some sort of very specific ideas about what they want to do. 
um, there are there are some patterns there, you know, um, definitely. Um, usually, I see two uh, two groups. You know, one group comes and basically they say, "I need a corpus which is from chemistry only. I need this to be updated every week, basically, and I have some sort of a specific um, requirement on this. This requires us basically to have good annotations, you know, good good data." and metadata about you know what is chemistry actually that's also not completely trivial basically it's not it, the data is not coming to us in exactly that sort of form um uh, you know they can have other sort of requirements they want to say you know i want everything from chemistry from 2010 onwards basically you know these kinds of things and then there's another group basically who say who come to us and they say i want everything you know every discipline of science all papers that were ever created and those these these things are for the for the kinds of use cases like plagiarism detection, you know, where basically you really need everything in order to solve that sort of need well. Yeah, sort of the the difference between a generalist problem and a specific a specific uh, yeah. domain specific problem. Exactly. Uh, um, one of the issues with um, machine learning. Um, AI, you know, I, I, I don't like the term AI, but um, it's very general, uh, is the ethics that go into algorithms and computational models. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the ethical challenges here yeah. when it comes to text and data mining? Absolutely. So um, in my view, there are both challenges as well as opportunities for sort of um, fighting bias with machine learning. And, you know, often the discussion which I see is somehow um, in favor of one against the other. But I think we always need to understand that, um, you know, machine learning is just a tool and it can be applied in both ethical and unethical ways. Um, so in terms of um, how in terms of the dangers, let's say. And so imagine that you develop a system for suggesting peer reviewers, basically, or, or actually maybe a better example. Imagine that you develop a system that um, uses the information from the text of research papers to say which papers are really good and which papers are not so good, let's say. Okay, that's already very, um, you know, this, this, this already very definition of this application is quite controversial, basically, but basically this is, this is what bibliometrics are doing, let's say. So, uh, you know, imagine that you're trying to use text to develop better bibliometrics. But um, we know, for instance, these days already that, um, let's say, Western scientists, and we know that men tend to be more cited than, than women, and, uh, and, and let's say, scientists from developing countries. Um, so, you know, if you develop a model like this, then the question is whether, what sort of data did you use, did you feed into this model? And is that model going to be biased towards or against basically a certain, certain group or demographic? Um, this is really challenging. Uh, and, um, and we also need to understand that, you know, the, the bias is not necessarily only created by the machine learning models. Actually, the bias exists in the society, you know, the society already already has that bias. Mm -hmm. So then you can look at the problem in another way. You know, can we actually use um, can we actually use machine learning to counter these biases? And you know, it is true that we can basically. You know, there are there are ways how you can sort of measure whether there is a bias uh, basically in a certain group. Um, statistical methods can be used um, to. Uh, you know, to find to find and detect these sort of biases. And if you find them, then, uh, for instance, I'll give this example of a system for recommending peer reviewers. So um, you, let's say, are looking for a funding panel, um, you know, and, um, and um, for a grant application. So, um, you know, the recommender system tells you, hey, use this researcher from Oxford, then use this researcher from uh, Carnegie Mellon. And maybe what you should do at that point, if you know that both of them are, let's say, both of these people who are experts and who were recommended by the system were men, maybe then recommend the system can really suggest you the most educated uh, black women from a developing country that would really very nicely complement that panel. And so effectively, um, we can apply machine learning and these sort of text and data mining techniques to 
sort of also fight these biases um, in the in, in in these ways. It's all about machine learning is a tool in my view, <laughs> but um, it you know it can be. We need to make sure, sure that it's also a good servant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you you have to be aware of these um, these challenges in order to fix them. Indeed. Yeah. So looking forward, you know, over the next decade or so, um, are there things that administrators and researchers should be thinking about um, to continue to deliver on the value that TDM can provide? That's a very good question. And I've been thinking about this uh, in the past for a while. And, um, uh, you know, the question is, um, what should the community be doing? And it's not only the administrators and researchers, it's also the funders, for instance, you know, what should be funded? Because the things that don't get funded often, um, often die or they cannot flourish in the way they should. Um, I think in terms of what, uh, what I see the scientific community doing uh, is that um, the scientific community, let's say, if I speak about researchers working in data, uh, in data science and then text and data mining, there is an overfocus, in my opinion, on methods. You know, this is just my opinion, but um, uh, I see basically, you know, that uh, you know someone is trying to solve a problem, and they come up with, oh, we solved it with super vection printer machines. Now, five years later, we're going to solve it with BERT and Cybert and 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 the sort of more more novel, uh, more novel uh, machine learning models, and everything seems to be sort of uh, really focused on these sort of smart methods. And the, the gains are very limited, basically. The gains are, you know, a few percentage up and, uh, and, and that's basically the reality. And, and we create these sort of black boxes. Um, the problem we are facing though, is basically that we can't have, we don't, I don't really see a systematic focus on data. I don't see a, fo a systematic focus on, on funders supporting basically these large infrastructures that let's say collect the data, curate the data, make the data better, um, effectively help, the, help these individual projects that try to focus on these methods to actually deliver something faster and better. Because also I'm, you know, I, I, was, um, I was speaking to, I don't want to name people uh, in this interview, but I was speaking to one particular person about a half a year ago who, who was from a very prominent American company who delivered a very important graph into about uh, about scholar uh, about scholarship and unfortunately this company decided to to no longer support that graph so i think that everyone who's knowledgeable now knows who that person was <laughs> basically but uh, and 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 he told me this this really important thing which i completely agree with and that that's basically that um it's not in the methods only it's actually in the data you know the, the these 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 machine learning models will really work well only if you've got a fantastic data set on which to apply them. So I think we are making as a community really big mistakes. I think funders also when they are considering grant applications, they are really not focusing on uh, the data sets that these use that the researchers are promising to deliver them and build their methods on. They are actually focusing on what's the grant application. Does it read well? You know, does it uh, is it original and so on? But actually, no one's asking the question: Is it realistic to build this? Basically. And I think that's a that's a really big mistake, and I would really like to see us be you know shifting in that direction. I think there's another really big challenge for administrators. Those who administer these sort of open access data sets, um, I think that it is important for them to sort of, and I think they are starting to understand the value that text and data mining can bring. But many of them, I would say 10 years ago, when I, when I started working on core, I would get regular emails basically from people who were saying, why are you stealing our open access data? You know, like, and, and I had to sort of argue with them like that there is a purpose, you know, why uh, actually aggregation is important and how it helps other people and so on. I would say I'm, I'm super happy that these days I'm not having to, I don't, I don't need to have these discussions. People really come to core and they say, I want to actually contribute my data. I want to be part of it. But actually, I think a lot of the stakeholders, a lot of these administrators, they are still pretty frustrated by the fact that, you know, they, they make the data available to you, but what do you deliver to them, basically? 
you know, that's the real challenge. So also the universities, for instance, they, they feel like, you know, we're supporting these, um, let's say, institutional repositories and they expose the articles, uh, you know, to the open world and so on. But actually then they are used, these articles are then used for all sorts of purposes, which are really beneficial. But what do we get out of this, you know? And, 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 and that, that is a real challenge. And I don't really have a complete answer to that because, um, uh, because the, the challenge of text and data mining is that basically those organizations that give out the data are not necessarily those that actually um, get the rewards from the application of the data. And that needs to be solved. Data citation. <laughs> yeah, for instance, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um... Uh, so many, several threads I'd like to dig yeah. down into it with regard to that. Um, the first is, I, I appreciate the shout out for um, the infrastructure investment necessary to make these things happen. Um, it is not simply, here is my data. Um, your data has to plug into everyone else's data. And there's a... Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be aggregation, but there does need to be standardization. There does need to be interoperability. Yeah. And that is not easy, particularly when you start to cross domains. Um, do you see a value in standardization there? And, and in what ways can we help the community support uh, text and data mining yeah. um, by like pushing us in particular directions. Yeah, I think that uh, you know um, standardization is a is a is a backbone of everything that needs to happen. We can't do anything without standardizations here. So I think it's a it, it, it's super important basically. Uh, if we um, I'll give I'll give you some examples basically about some of the frustrations that a lot of the text and data miners face these days. Um, let's say you know they get data uh, they want to get full text information from uh, research papers and what they get are or what we provide to them are basically is 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 some plain text extracted from pdfs for instance that is not standardized it's ugly and it's 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 you know it's far from clean data we ourselves are you know doing at the moment everything possible to actually deliver to our users uh, a more sort of the data in a more semi structured format and you know there are some formats which have been created. One of them is, for instance, uh, TEI, Text Encoding Initiative. There's also something which is called JATS. Um, you know this is what publishers provide for text and data mining. Uh, this is these are you know really significant steps forward, but um, it's not sufficient. You know, for instance, like if we get data from institutional repositories, we get them as PDFs. How difficult would it really be for these repositories to, for instance, expose the data to us only in LaTeX, which is much more machine readable? You know, LaTeX is not amazing. It's not. It's not exactly what we would want to have, but it would be a lot better than having it in a PDF. Um, but uh, you know, th this is not where it should stop. Of course not. You know, we would like to have. Um, um, I think it would be fantastic to have semi-structured information, um, you know, you know, to, to truly encode articles in a in a machine readable format. It would need that, it would mean that, for instance, you would have the names of methods it would be um, would be, let's say, uh, elements effectively. You know, they would be marked within the text and they would have an ID. So you would know which method is being talked about. You would want to have basically citations annotated by their semantic type. For instance, you know, is this citation about, uh, you know, paying homage to the um, to the uh, authors or is it about us, the, you know, the, the, the article following on, uh, on, on what was described in previous work, or is it a criticism, for instance? This is the, the, these are exactly the things. We would like to have headings, Mark. We would like to have, um, you know, um, um, uh, conclusions, Mark. We would like to have uh, uh, have the tables uh, done, uh, annotated in some, in some way so that the information within those tables can be interpreted. The same for graphs. So, um, I think uh, you know standardizing these sorts of things and creating vocabularies, glossaries, uh, so that we can link research papers to uh, to, uh, to 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 the elements and entities which are mentioned in them, and we know also in which context they are mentioned, is um, 
it's the work for the next decade, I think, you know, it's, it's not something, I don't think that NISO can solve it in, you know, in a year or something like that. But I think, you know, NISO can, for instance, go um, in the direction of, 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 of improving the situation, and it needs to be recognized as a continuous effort, it won't be solved overnight. Yeah. Interesting thought there, as, you know, in a world where things content goes through a publisher work cycle, life cycle right yeah. um author sends a sub makes a submission to a publisher publisher does all that markup um increasingly there's a move towards just posting things um without this you know oh i dropped the word file into a repository check that open access box um there isn't, I'm kind of wondering what the role of the, uh, like I've been spending some time over the last couple of months thinking about the uh, role of the author here and how much of this is training authors, at least in the basics of, you know, what is a header? Why do you use headers? Like, why do you use some of the semantics in your authoring process? Like whatever that authoring process is, it could be Microsoft Word, it could be Google Docs, whatever, but they have styles and they're meaningful, not just in what it looks like, but in adding semantics to a document. And it seems to me that the, the gap here starts with the author in getting the author to do this sort of thing and it's these are not hard things for people to do, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, pick pick your uh, style from a drop down list, um, and getting people to realize that it's not about what it looks like on the screen. It's about what you mean when you say this is a header, this is a section, this is a table, mm -hmm. um, this is a citation. Um, th those sorts of things. I think are, are not, I mean, those standards exist. It's getting people to understand and use them. Be interested to, as a, as a kind of wrap up here, kind of think, get your thoughts about if we don't get the world, i.e. the authoring community involved in this process, then it's just, we're having to fix the things later in the, we, those involved in setting these systems up yeah are have to go back and correct what mm. wasn't done properly the first time yeah. and it seems like the larger your aggregation like if you have millions and millions of documents this starts to become unwieldy yeah. um do you think there's any any hope <laughs> in yeah. in pushing it down to yeah. to that level it's a very difficult question, and I, I, I'm afraid I won't give you a straight answer to this one, basically. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, in, in, indeed, there are, you know, both of these elements are, are, are important, you know, both educating the authors, and I think also, I think it's also about creating tools which sort of um, assist the, the researchers in the process of writing the manuscripts so that the process doesn't become too complicated i'll give some examples basically you know uh, it, it's been it's, it has become very popular and, and i think man, almost mandated i think by a lot of publishers but i think this is also adopted by the open access community a lot to um to give orchid ids basically to uh, authors basically on all documents now um Imagine that, and, and this is obviously a very good thing, I don't criticize it at all, but now imagine that there are, I mean, let's recognize that there are other entities in the research paper that would also like to have, uh, would, would also deserve IDs, okay? So um, scientific methods, names of data sets, basically, you know, uh, names of uh, affiliations of institutions, um, you name them, there are, there are many of these things. And are we sort of really imagining that each of them would have an ID inside the manuscript. Can you imagine how these manuscripts would even look like? Who would read them? You know, I wouldn't basically. So um, I, I think I, I personally, I, I just think that you know, um, uh, putting orchid IDs or any sort of IDs in a PDF that is intended for that is intended for um, 
not machine, uh, not for machine sort of readability, but for user readability. It's just silly. Uh, you should really have this in metadata. You know, that's where the ORCID IDs have a sense. You know, you, there should be always two versions of the manuscript for machine readable for ma uh, machine readable version and a human readable version, basically. And the machine readable version should have basically these uh, all these sorts of IDs, and then and and that should be available there. Now, what would need to happen in order for the authors to really start adding that semantics, you know, these sort of semantics into the document. I really genuinely think that, um, you know, if we ask authors to do everything themselves by hand using a word data, a word processor, they will become really bored over a while and they will probably not do it well because it's just really bad. For, you know, humans are not very good at, you know, with sort of complying with things. So you need, you need tools for maybe validating that they are doing it well, but I, even better, you should have tools for sort of that help the humans to sort of do it well. You know, for instance, um, um, like while I'm writing um, the manuscript, and I'm when I put my name as an author into the document, I'll just write author Peter North. Immediately, I should get basically an auto completion suggestion, which should say, Hey, which Peter Noss do you mean? Do you mean this one guy from the Open University, or do you mean another guy? I'm not a very good example because my name is not so ambiguous, but it would be much more, much more better, you know, to, to do this with, with other yeah. people. But, yeah. uh, but, but you know, you, you, I think you get the idea that basically also when you write, you write support vector machine, then basically if there was a taxonomy of, of, of methods, then it could, you know, you can get an auto-completion box. It says, which, which one do you mean? And then you say enter and, and, and it's in the manuscript. So I think if, if the, we can only, I think, uh, achieve sort of um, interoperability of these manuscripts and uh, sort of, um, uh, our authors' compliance with these rules if we also give them tools uh, through which they can deliver it. Well, I think that's a, a great place to end on, both in terms of what we can do with it, with the content once it's structured, but how we can also use the same tools to help structure it. Um, Peter, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. Uh, this has been a great conversation, a great way to uh, uh, contribute to this program. So thank you so much. And looking forward to your, uh, more hearing more about your continued work. You guys are doing great work at, the, at CORE and the Open University. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Right. Bye. Bye.